We'll see you guys in about 30 minutes or so. Okay. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> So we're still, though, we're missing Christina and Hayden. All right, we've got our five minute. Uh, Delay. So, all right. Well, we will uh, start. Let me make sure we. All right, we are recording. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, before uh, we get into uh, tonight's major portion section, uh, I want to uh, first uh, remind you about Passover starting this coming Saturday night, and because it's Saturday night, the uh, kiddush includes with it the Havdalah, and you'll see in the in the uh, Haggadot, it has in it the, what you have to do for the Havdalah. Uh, we're going to practice some of the readings from that in a moment. But also, and something I neglected to uh, uh, talk about, is that the second night of Passover, we start what is called in Hebrew, Sirata Omer, the counting of the Omer. It says in the Torah, Shabbat. you shall count for yourselves after the day after the Sabbath, uh, 50 days. Uh, and uh, the 50th day uh, is the holiday of Shavuot. Now, the Torah itself is unclear when it says, Shabbat, the day after the Sabbath, what exactly is that a reference to? And so uh, Jewish tradition uh, understood that to mean the day after the Sabbath is a reference to the day after the first day of Passover. So we start counting the Omer from the uh, day after the first day of Passover. In our case, it's uh, outside the land of Israel. It's the night of the second Seder. Most Haggadot also have in the Haggadah uh, the wording for that counting of the Omer. And we're supposed to count the Omer each night uh, for the uh, 50 days. Uh, I'll actually count it each, the 49th day. We don't count the 50th. Uh, and um, we have a bracha, a blessing. Uh, Omer, the counting of the Omer. Uh, and then we recite what day of the Omer it is. Uh, and uh, we also... Uh, recite when it fits a week. So it's tonight is the first night of the Omer, second night of the Omer, third night of the Omer, uh, seventh night of the Omer, which is one week. Tonight is the eighth day of the Omer, which is one week and one day, uh, night, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the tradition uh, developed very clearly that we have to count the Omer and we have to try and count it every night. If we miss a night, uh, we have all day to catch up during the next day. If we don't count the Omer by the end of that day, then from then on, we're still supposed to count the Omer, but we do it without a blessing. And since we're supposed to be very careful about the counting the Omer, we never say to somebody, if somebody says you, what night, is, what night of the Omer is tonight? You, you say yesterday we counted. We never say what tonight is when it is. So for example, if tonight were the first day of the Omer, we would say last night we didn't count the Omer. Tonight we'd start counting. Or if tonight's the fifth night of the Omer, we'd say last night was the fourth day of the Omer uh, till we get all the way through. Also the Omer period at some stage of history, it's unclear when exactly, became associated uh, with a period of mourning, according to tradition, it uh, commemorates the death of the students of Rabbi Akiva. Uh, and uh, there are different customs that are developed around it. Uh, some count uh, of, I mean, excuse me, some observe the uh, period of time of the Omer as a kind of mourning period for the students of Rabbi Akiva. So no parties, no weddings are held, uh, 
there are different customs as to when, how we count that. Some do the first 33 days of the Omer, and the 33rd day of the Omer is Lakba Omer, which means the 33rd day of the Omer, after which we no longer have these morning thing, uh, morning, which we'll talk about next week, actually, uh, not in two weeks, excuse me. Uh, we'll talk about morning practices, but includes haircuts and, and, and trim, shaving the beard and all that sort of thing. Uh, so when we talk about Shavuot, we'll talk about it a little bit more as well. But uh, starting uh, the second night of the Omer, we, uh, second night of Passover, we start counting the Omer. Okay? Uh, and uh, my tradition is to hold the first 33 days and then after Lag Omer do weddings. Uh, now, in the conservative movement, there have been lots of different approaches towards counting of the Omer and how observant to be of counting the Omer. Different synagogues have different traditions on how they follow that. You can uh, check with your rabbi again to uh, see exactly how uh, he or she says you should count the Omer. Okay, is that clear to everybody? And there are Omer counters, and I will send you one in the mail. I'll send you an email with it. Also, I sent an email earlier today with the revised schedule so that you know what we're doing to, to the end it includes uh, the section that we didn't make on the, uh, the one night quick history course. All right. So we will practice some Hebrew. So in order to do that, I need to, oh, here it is, share the screen. Oh, by the way, uh, this is what the Omer counter will look like when I send it out to you. Uh, Monday means in, uh, the night before, so uh, there'll be Sunday night. Uh, we will count, uh, start counting the Omer. Because right. the day begins with sunset, and so that's, according to the Hebrew calendar, that would be the day. I have to correct this a little bit to make it all ready for this year. Okay, uh, let's see, this. Where, where is it? Oh, there we go. Okay, so these are some of the blessings that we will recite during the course of the evening on uh, Passover and during the Seder. Uh, and uh, I want us to uh, practice them together. Uh, this will be your Hebrew practice for tonight. Uh, so I ask you to unmute yourselves. It's such a strange word to mute. Sound can like, you just zoom in a bit? Excuse me? Can you make it a bit bigger? Sure, I can. Sure, I can. Let's see. Uh, so. How's that? Great. Did it work? Yeah. Okay. For, sorry, I forgot. For me, it was it was fine. <laughs> okay. Let's go, start with line number one. All right. This shall be very easy for everybody. We say, Baruch. 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 Ata. Ata. Adonai. Aloheinu. Melech, Melech, Haolam, Haolam, Bore, 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 Hari, Hari, Agafen, Agafen. That's for which what? That's a blessing for what? Kiddush. For the wine. The wine. And during the course of our seder, we will say that bracha four times. By the way, that's one of the differences between the Ashkenazic Haggadah and the Sephardi Haggadah is we say the blessing every time we drink one of the four cups of wine. Uh, the Sephardim only say it the first time and uh, the time that we have the cup of wine after Birkat Hamazon. All right, so let's go down now to line number two. Okay, we have Baruch. Uh, Ata, Ata, Adonai, Adonai, 
Eloheinu. Melech. Melech. Ha'olam. Ha'olam. Bore. Bore. Whoops. Me'ore. Me'ore. Ha'esh. Ha'esh. Anybody know what that's a blessing for? For the candlelight? Havdalah. For the Havdalah. Now, the way we do Havdalah on Yom Tov is we don't light a, a separate candle. Uh, most people don't. What we do is we uh, the order will be at your Seder table the second night. You have the Kiddush. And then as part of the Kiddush, you will have the Havdalah. The candles for Yom Tov should already be lit. So what we do is we use the light of those candles for the Havdalah. Uh, and uh, we look at those candles, look at our fingernails and the light of those candles to fulfill the mitzvah of saying the blessing for Havdalah. Okay, let's look at line number three. We have Baruch. Baruch. Ata. Ata. Adonai. Adonai. Eloheinu. Eloheinu. Melech. 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 Got it. Know this by now. Haolam. 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 Jehakal. No. no. <laughs> you oh, guess it. Got... <laughs> oh, yes. Shechayanu. 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 Vikimanu. 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 Lazman. Lazman. Azeh. Okay. That's the Shekhyana. You say that we light the candles or and also during the Kiddush, if you haven't said Shekhyana yet. Okay, line number four, we have again. Baruch. Yeah, let me hear you guys. Baruch. 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 Yep. Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Olam um, that's what we say when we eat the carpus, whatever we have for the green vegetable to dip in the salt water. Okay. Mm -hmm. Normally during a meal, we would, we would say the hamotzi and then we would say that it covers everything in the meal. But because of the nature of the Passover Seder, we have something first. And so therefore we say a bracha before we eat that. Okay, line number five. Ma. Ma. Mishtana. Alayla. Alayla. Azeh. Azeh. Nicole. Nicole. Hallelot. Hallelot. Six. Shabbat Shabbat Hallelot. Hallelot. Anu. Anu. Right this way. Oh, Oh, Queen. Uh, mates. Uh, mates. 
Umatsa. Umatsa. Lila. Lila. Azer. Azer. Kulo. Kulo. Matsa. Okay, line seven, we have Shebechol, Alelot, Anu, Ochlin, Shear, Yerakot, Yerakot, Alayla, Alayla, Azer, Azer, Maror, Maror. Okay. Line number eight. Shebechol, Shebechol, Alelot. Alelot. Ain. Ain. Anu. Anu. Mat bilin. Mat bilin. Afilu. Afilu. Aam. Aam. Echat. Echat. Alayla. Alayla. Hazer. Hazer. Shete. Shete. The Amin. The Amin. Line number nine. Shebechol. Shebechol. Alelot, Alelot, Anu, Anu, Ochlin, Ochlin, Bain, Bain, Yoshvin, Yoshvin, Uvein, Uvein, Misubin. Mesubin. Alayla. 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 Azer. Azer. Kulanu. 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 Misubin. Misubin. Okay, so those are the four questions. All right. Why do we need all of the nice sweet? Matzah, chametz, or matzah. Tonight is only matzah. All other nights, we eat any kind, all kinds of vegetables. I said this night is bitter vegetables, bitter herbs. Uh, on, uh, on all other nights, we don't dip even one time. Tonight we dip two times. And all other nights, uh, we eat whether we're sitting up or we reclining. This night we all recline. Okay. So those are the four questions that uh, the Seder answers during the course of the evening. Next joke. Ready. Stop share. Ah, okay. All right, so tonight uh, we are continuing with the uh, life cycle and the rituals that go along with it. And uh, obviously, the, one of the most important valuable things in Jewish traditions to get married, have a family, uh, that is a very uh, important Jewish tradition. Uh, and it go, goes back to the biblical account that God says to Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, and so our tradition teaches that there is a desire that everyone should marry, that everyone should have offspring. Uh, we are meant to 
uh, replenish the world, make sure have people in the world. Uh, certainly Judaism as in many religions uh, uh, saw this as being a positive element of life. You know, one of the, and one of the differences, we may have touched upon it before, between Judaism and Christianity is that for Judaism, this is not, uh, you know, you got to do, you know, what can I tell you? It's, you know, the only way to be fruitful, multiply is have sex. If you avoid it, according to Paul, you, you skip it altogether. Catholic Church, the idea of celibacy uh, is, is certainly something that was important and still is important to the church. For Judaism, that is something contrary to the Jewish ideal. Uh, the ideal is uh, for marriage, the ideal is to have children, the ideal is to enjoy the, the relationship of a husband and wife in the marital state. All of these are considered to be goods uh, and uh, beneficial goods and uh, aspects of life. Uh, and indeed, uh, we'll see in a minute that one of the aspects of, of what a husband promises his wife in the traditional ketubah is to uh, provide for her sexual needs. It's interesting, the rabbis say that the mitzvah of Uruvu, be fruitful and multiply, is incumbent upon the man and not the woman. Because the woman, when she gets pregnant, especially in the ancient world and still today, endangers her life to a certain degree. And so the rabbi said that women were not obligated, at least according to most rabbinic opinions, in that a mitzvah. And uh, that opens the door. Uh, when, uh, did we talk about birth control and Jewish attitudes towards it? No, we didn't. Okay. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so that uh, figures in in that understanding of the birth control as well as the understanding of, of, the, of abortion and when abortions are permitted and when they are not permitted. Right? So in the ancient world, no, you know, rarely do two people go to the local uh, singles bar uh, and uh, meet up and uh, get married. Although, if you remember, we talked about how uh, uh, Jacob met his wife at the, the uh, well. Uh, uh, the Abraham's servant who was sent to find a wife for Isaac uh, met Rebecca at the well. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, when he went to Midian, he met his wife at the well. So I guess the, the local well was the local uh, singles bar in those days. But we know for good, up until modern times, really, marriage was often uh, not romantic in the sense of, you know, two people just finding each other. No Romeo and Juliet kind of thing. Marriages were arranged. Uh, people got together and said, well, your, your son and my daughter will make a good match, or a matchmaker would say they would make a good match, or there were business dealings, or um, countries that had kings and, and queens and needed to make alliances. All of those were part and parcel of marriage in the ancient world. Uh, and marriage also was a business agreement. There are certain aspects of marriage that have uh, at least traditionally been associated with obligations and responsibilities to a husband and wife, to property that is brought into a marriage. All of that was part and parcel of the ancient uh, Jewish approach towards marriage. So that uh, we have, even till today, the tradition is that uh, there is a marriage document called the Ketubah. And the Ketubah, as uh, read to you a little bit later, uh, essentially uh, guarantees uh, the wife's uh, sta status in the terms of that marriage. And, and God forbid anything happens to the husband or happens to the marriage. Okay, So uh, that's the first thing to remember. Now, certainly today, marriages are not necessarily arranged. Uh, people find the other person that they're interested in in all kinds of manners today, uh, whether it be introduction by friends, if it's somebody you meet at work, somebody you meet on a social occasion, or today, I know when I was still uh, in the active rabbinate and had a uh, number of weddings, 
people had often met uh, on one of the uh, mating, uh, dating uh, apps. And there are several Jewish ones out there that uh, are designed for people who want to find a Jewish spouse. And just like any of the other apps that are out there, you know, you take your chances or whatever the case may be if you use it. Right. But let's say, regardless, regardless of uh, how the couple gets together, uh, they uh, at some point in time will decide they want to get married. And the Jewish marriage contains certain elements, and we're going to go over those elements. Right? Uh, first and foremost is that uh, ideally, a man and a woman live together as husband and wife. That is the ideal in Jewish tradition. Uh, and the marriage is really created not by rabbis but is really created by the man giving something of value to the woman and the two of them agreeing to create that marriage. That's essentially what it is. Um, so uh, the easiest way to, to go over it is to, to explain what happens in terms of the marriage ceremony. First of all, get engaged, mazel tov, mazel tov. When are you gonna get married? Isn't it about time? Uh, you know whatever people are going to say. Uh, and so uh, uh, the idea of an engagement party really is a, is a traditional Jewish concept. It's usually called l'chaim because you drink a l'chaim to the bride and groom and you invite everybody over and the two sides of the family get to look at the other side of the family and oh, you, you, you made a mistake here or yeah, you're nice people or whatever the case is. All right. So you've got to pick a date. There are certain times on the calendar when traditionally marriages don't take place. So consult your rabbi before you uh, pick a date. As a matter of fact, find a rabbi first. I've had a number, you know, it's happened many a times. I get a call, uh, we've got a, everything else arranged, but we didn't arrange for a rabbi and this rabbi can't make it and that rabbi can't make it. Are you available? Okay, so I triple my price when I hear the no. right. uh, But it's important to, to speak with a rabbi uh, to uh, make sure that everything is on track that you need. Um, so you're going to have to have a place where you're going to get married. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be the backyard, your living room, whatever. I'm just, you know, right? Um, and ideally, it should be a kosher ceremony and a kosher meal that's with it. In Jewish tradition, uh, all of our uh, rituals, all of our ceremonies are uh, contain along with them the idea of a uh, celebratory meal, and which is really in many ways part and parcel of the wedding ceremony itself, as I'll explain later. All right. So you've picked a date. You've got the rabbi lined up. You've decided what you're gonna do for the food and everything in that department. So now, of course, you have to have a ring. Jewish tradition uh, prescribes that there, there are three ways to contract a marriage. Shtar, kesef, lubia. One can marry through a document. One can marry through the transference of money or monetary value, or one can actually create a marital bond by having sexual relations for the purpose of being married. Mm -hmm. The rabbis frowned on the last one, uh, but in theory, if you have two witnesses outside the door to your apartment uh, where you're together as husband and wife together, that can constitute technically a Jewish marriage. It's not fully done, but it, it creates what we call the, the erusin, the uh, betrothal. Okay. So uh, today, what normally transpires is that uh, under the chuppah, we do everything together at one time under the chuppah, the groom will give the bride a ring. Traditionally, it's, it's a plain band 
usually today, gold or whatever material. The rabbi said it had to be, uh, the value of it has to be easily ascertainable uh, to, to work in this manner. In other words, that's why traditionally we don't allow stones in the marriage ring itself. It's usually just a plain gold band. Uh, if uh, you want to have a fancier ring for, for a wedding ring, what is often done is uh, there's somebody in the family who has a plain gold band and you, uh, the groom has to purchase it and then give it to the bride under the chuppah. And if the bride chooses to give it back to somebody or to sell it back to somebody or whatever, they can do so. All right, so now we're getting ready for, for the, the uh, big nuptials. So there is a tradition that the Shabbat, uh, uh, usually Shabbat before uh, in, uh, the wedding takes place, it was originally that the groom would be called to the Torah for an aliyah, and there would be a special blessing said for the bride and the groom. Different synagogues today have different ways they handle it. That's, all, again, one of the reasons why talking to a rabbi, if you're going to have, it's called a yinish and ufruf. Uh, in, in Hebrew, they're referred to as Shabbat chatan, uh, traditionally. And uh, in the Ashkenazic tradition, this takes place on the Shab usually the Shabbat immediately prior to the wedding. Doesn't have to be uh, the immediate Shabbat before, but it was it is often done. You know, again, you talk to your, your rabbi. In Sephardic circles, they actually do it the, the Shabbat at, immediately after the wedding. Uh, so it works in different ways. Okay. So now you've uh, made arrangements, uh, however, that's going to be handled for the uh, well, for if that's what you choose to have, it's not absolutely necessary. Now, if you chose a nor normal day of the week, an ordinary day on the calendar, there is a tradition for the bride and groom to fast the day of their wedding. Again, it's not obligatory, it's a tradition. And, uh, but it, the idea being that this is a very important uh, stage, important milestone in someone's life, and it's marked. Uh, in uh, being seen as in some ways like a, a Yom Kippur Katan, a, a, a Yom Kippur for bride and groom, that their sins are forgiven on that day of their wedding. And there's a special connection said to be between the groom, bride and groom and the Kaddish Baruch, the Holy One, play, praise be he. Uh, and so that's why uh, there's a tradition at the, because usually weddings are in late afternoon or evening, uh, at the mincha service, if one attends, the groom uh, and, and or the bride recite the same confessional that we recite on Yom Kippur. Because the idea that that is how much a change in their status, their life is going to be. Uh, if it's a Rosh Chodesh or other days, uh, there are the certain times that the bride and groom don't fast. Uh, I always, when I speak to a bride and groom, I usually say it's usually the, the, the groom, uh, you know, has, uh, has a hard time fasting and the bride's usually so nervous and, and the brides don't usually seem to be having much trouble fasting. Uh, but if, by the way, if, the, if it interferes in some way, you can have, you know, you can break the fast right away. No question about that. And part of the tradition in a traditional wedding ceremony, it, when we get to it, uh, there's something to eat for the bride and groom immediately following the ceremony. Okay, so now we've uh, reached the big day. Bride and groom have either fasted, not fasted, whatever the case may be. Everybody, you know, have to march in. You don't have to. The only thing is important is that the bride and groom uh, are together under the chuppah. The chuppah is the wedding canopy that uh, Jewish tradition says is where the wedding takes place. And it's said to uh, represent the future home of the bridegroom, uh, open on all sides as a symbol of welcoming of guests and people to come into. Now, if you do march down, there is no way it has to be done. Uh, the standard way that it is done that doesn't mean it has to be this way, but the way most weddings are, you have uh, 
the elderly relatives who want to be able to participate but don't uh, want to stand up under the chuppah, or you don't want them standing under the chuppah, they come in first. Then you have the groomsmen and then the, the groom's parents, the chatan's parents, uh, walk halfway down the aisle, the groom walks in, they, they then escort them to under the chuppah. In many Orthodox uh, weddings, the groom will put on a kittel, just like on Yom Kippur, uh, the white coat, uh, which is also the garb that we wear uh, at death. Okay. So then comes the bride's turns. You have bridesmaids, you have flower girls, whatever the case may be. Um, again, the bride's parents uh, you know, walk down the aisle halfway. The bride comes in, they escort the bride to the foot of the chuppah or up to the chuppah to where the groom is. Now, uh, a, ma a major Ashkenazic tradition is, is that the bride circles the groom three or uh, seven times you know, for the, the ceremony. Uh, again, you talk to your rabbi about what is going, uh, how that is to be handled. Okay, I made a mistake. I skipped something. I've done that on occasion. Before we get to all of this, there are a few things, there's some paperwork that has to be handled. First of all, you have to have a license from the province of Ontario, if you're getting married in Ontario. You, uh, and that you have to arrange by going to uh, the city halls or various ones you can go to. Uh, and uh, I think they're good for three months. Uh, and your rabbi, of course, will talk to you about that. Uh, as well. Now, there is also a ketubah. The ketubah is a traditional Jewish wedding document. Uh, and the, the ketubah has its origins in rabbinic tradition. The re reason for the ketubah really goes to the fact that traditionally the wedding, the marriage, excuse me, is not really completely uh, equal. It, we read in the Torah that if a man finds something uh, untoward in his wife, Ervat uh, Davar, he can write her a bill of divorce and send her away. That's what, uh, and so the rabbis understood that to mean that only the groom, only the husband, has power of divorce. We will talk about that more a little bit later this evening when we talk about divorce in Jewish law. Um, but in order to protect the wife, the rabbis instituted what is called the ketubah. Ketubah is a document. In it, uh, it's written traditionally in Aramaic. And it, uh, traditionally, it sa basically says that the groom, in the presence of witnesses on a, in a certain day of the week, certain time of the month, etc., uh, uh, says to the bride, be, be my wife in accordance with the law of Moses and Israel, and I will cherish, honor, support, and maintain you in accordance with the custom of Jewish husbands who cherish, honor, support, and maintain their wives in truth. And I here uh, with make for you a settlement uh, 200 zuzim. Uh, how much a zuzim is worth today is a good question. Uh, the document says that the uh, status of the bride, again, this is an ancient thing and it's not uh, a, a very modern concept. Uh, a first bride, uh, unmarried woman, is given a ketubah of a total of 200 zuzim. Well, she's been married before, divorced, widowed, what have you. It was traditionally only a hundred system. Now, the groom can add what he wants to it. He can put much more in that if he chooses. And in Israel, especially in Sephardic circles, they put real money into the ketubah. Uh, a mil, you know, you hear a ketubah of a million dollars. Right? Here today in our world, this is pr uh, purely ceremonial. Because obviously, God forbid, anything happens to the marriage that's decided by civil courts in, in accordance with civil law. But uh, as we, as I say, when we get to the get, it still is part and parcel of Jewish tradition. So 
what happens? So the groom promises a certain sum of money to the bride. Uh, and also he promises uh, that uh, he will provide for her food, clothing and necessaries, uh, shark and all of those things that uh, are obligatory to a man to give to his wife. And uh, he uh, promises to provide uh, for a marriage settlement, God forbid. Uh, and he also promises to take uh, responsibility for any property that the bride brings into the marriage. And he mortgages, he has a lien against all of his property, anything and everything that he owns up to the shirt off of his back, the glima al katafai, to uh, uh, cover whatever the bride brings into the marriage. And if she should, you know, if the marriage is dissolved, she will recuperate all those sums. And the bride, by accepting this ketubah, uh, takes upon herself to live in accordance with her husband, according to Jewish tradition. Now, traditionally, this document, as I said, was in Aramaic. It was witnessed by two witnesses. Traditionally, they have were male, Shomer Shabbat, and being Sabbath observant. Again, you talk to your rabbi uh, when the time comes, what he or she uh, says take, has to be there. So traditionally, the ketubah is signed before the wedding. All right. Uh, if you go to an Orthodox wedding, they often have the men in one room and the women in another. They sign the ketubah, uh, and then they bring it to where the bride is. Uh, for uh, if there's going to be a signature of the bride on it, again you talk to the rabbi. Uh, depending upon how it is staged, in Orthodox circles, they also will have what is called a tenayim, they sign documents, uh, uh, pre-marriage documents. We won't go into to that. You, again, you talk to your rabbi if they have anything that they, they insist upon. Uh, if the bride is there for this part, because a lot of conservative rabbis, we just do it in our study or in a room to, all together. Uh, the second thing that takes place there after the signing of the marriage license and the witnessing of the ketubah, is what is called in Yiddish the bedekin. The groom will place the bride a veil over the bride. Traditionally, the brides are veiled for the wedding ceremony. According to Maimonides, that is an absolute necessity. Uh, and then uh, they have the part about marching in. Okay, so we've now went back. We're marched in. We're under the chuppah. Uh, the groom uh, is to the bride is traditionally to the right of the groom. Right? Or, and usually, not always, but usually the bride and groom stand so that their back is to the congregation. And they're facing towards the rabbi with the back towards the congregation. Um, it, it, it is sometimes done the other way. It depends on, on you and what your desires and or, again, what you work out with your rabbi. Um, then traditionally, there are two cups of wine under the chuppah. Some rabbis use only one. I, for example, and many of my colleagues insist upon two uh, and uh, wine uh, glasses that are there. Um, and then the rabbi who is Masader Kiddushin, who is, who is the uh, one who's performing this ceremony, uh, takes the first cup of wine, says the Bere Priya the blessing over wine. And then he recites what is called Birchat Erusin, the uh, betrothal blessing. Uh, which uh, essentially said, praise God, the King of the Universe, sanctifies his commandments, command is concerning forbidden relations and forbidden us, those who were merely betrothed, they allow us to all lawfully married, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an idea here that this is, creates the marital bond that permits a man and a woman eventually for a husband and wife together. Then traditionally, the groom takes a sip of the wine. The bride's veil is lifted up uh, so that she can take a sip of the wine. And then the veil is, is lowered back down. Usually what then happens is the ketubah is read. Oh, excuse me, before that, I keep going out of line. I did this once at a wedding too and got in trouble. 
Uh, now the groom turns to the bride and she holds out her right index finger traditionally. And before the groom puts the ring on the bride's finger, he says, Hare at Mekudesh at Li, but the Badzok that Moshe of Israel, behold, you're consecrated to me by this ring, and of course, Law of Moses and people of Israel. Again, traditionally, you have two witnesses who witness the giving of the ring. Uh, they will also be asked to ascertain that it's worth at least a pruta, which means it's got to be worth at least a few pennies, uh, and that the uh, groom gives the bride the ring. Now, in traditional weddings, there was no giving of the ring from the bride to the groom. Uh, most of my colleagues will, will permit it, but they usually uh, have it after the reading of the ketubah to serve as a separation. Uh, so usually, again, what happens? The ketubah is read. The groom then gives the bride the ketubah. She hands it over to somebody for safekeeping. If the rabbi is going to make remarks, he often makes remarks then. Some rabbis make it at the beginning, some at the end. It, it varies depending upon the rabbi. Um, and then uh, if the bride is going to give the groom a ring, uh, then they will face each other usually. And the bride will give the ring to the groom. Uh, those of us who are, follow tradition more strictly will have the bride say, Ani do di do di li. I'm my beloved, so my beloved is mine. It's not the same language of erusin, of betrothal, because the betrothal has already been created by the groom giving the ring to the bride and the bride accepting the ring. So now, originally, this, all of this ceremony took place many months before the conclusion. And at some stage of history, the two parts of the marriage ceremony were brought together as we do today. So the second part is called the uh, Kiddushin uh, or Chupa, excuse, excuse me, Chupa. Uh, and um, the, the, uh, basically what this entails is we take a second cup of wine and we recite seven blessings, the Sheva Brachot, the seven wedding blessings that essentially uh, relate what is transpiring. Again, there's always, with all of these, we have Borei Piragaf and the blessing over the, the wine. And then the, the, the Sheva Brachot, uh, praise God for the fruit of the vine, creates God and creates creator everything for his glory. Uh, who's created human beings, who is uh, in, in the divine image, uh, who uh, cleanses Israel, Zion through restoring our children, uh, gladden the bride and uh, groom and, and, and bride, and then praising God, uh, who helps means together the bride and groom for rejoicing and, and, and celebrating. Uh, and so soon may it be heard in the streets of Jerusalem, sound of bride and groom and uh, people rejoicing at the chuppah. Once again, the bride and groom drink from the wine. This time the bride's veil is traditionally, in most cases, put back out of the way. So it's out of the way altogether. The last step is the breaking of a glass. This is uh, based upon a, a Talmudic tradition uh, that essentially is saying that even in our times of joy, we have to be aware of uh, sadness in the world, uh, represented by the, the destruction of the ancient temple. Uh, and so traditionally, something of, is broken, a glass, some people will, will have a glass for that, some will take a, a, a light bulb wrapped up in the, in the groom, uh, using his right foot, stamps on the glass, and then everybody yells out, Mazel Tov. It really shouldn't be at that point, but that's what everybody does because that's really remembrance of the destruction of the temple, but that's what people do. Following the ceremony, the bride and groom are supposed to retreat to a room uh, where they are clearly alone together for a period of time with witnesses outside the door uh, to symbolize that they are now husband and wife. Traditionally, uh, married men, unmarried men, and unmarried women did not uh, segregate together uh, by themselves. It was just not done in the ancient Jewish world, still not done in very orthodox circles. 
that a woman will not be alone with a man who's not her husband. So this is a sign of that. And by eating together, having something to eat, breaking the fast, uh, this also symbolizes the home and that you're creating a marital life together. Now the Sheva Brachot, the seven wedding blessings are actually can be recited at any time there's a meal. They certainly are recited at the wedding meal after the Birkat HaMazon. Uh, and then any time during the next week, the seven days, if there's somebody who has not been around before for the Sheva Brachot, and there's a minion, the tradition is that the, the, we can recite the Sheva Brachot again as part of the uh, grace after meals of Birkat Hamazon. Now, it's because in part uh, that in, in Jewish tradition, it developed early on that uh, any kind of blood that was visible in the female organ was regarded as menstrual blood. So assuming there was a virgin marriage, virgin bride, that was the first time they had sexual relations and normally there would be blood and, and we're not gonna go into all of that. The, you know, in the ancient world, that was very important. Uh, but it became regarded by the rabbinic tradition to be just like a woman had her menses. And so the husband and wife, after that first encounter, would not have sexual relations for at least a, a week and a half uh, because of, as we do with menses. All right. um, and so there was no such thing as a, a uh, honeymoon going off somewhere. But and again, this is found in many uh, traditional circles. People are invited. They invite the bride and groom to, to their homes for a festive meal where the Sheva Brachot recited all these kinds of things that transpire uh, during that time. Yeah. Now, uh, there are other things that can be done and can be part of the marriage ceremonies and things that, again, you talk to your rabbi, you talk to the rabbi what kind of ketubah you're going to have. It's going to be the traditional ketubah. Some permit different other kinds of ketubah out there. Again, I, you know, you have to consult with your rabbi as to the nature <coughs> of the ketubah. You can have cheap ones. You can, I do mine. Sometimes I do it right off my computer for people for a simple wedding. Or you can pay a lot of money to have a very fancy ketubah made, even a scribal one made for just your wedding and et cetera. Okay. So that's essentially uh, what transpires in terms of the wedding ceremony, getting ready, all those kinds of things. All right. Now, as I mentioned, the Torah in, in Deuteronomy speaks to the possibility of divorce. And uh, the language used in the Torah is if a man sees something as ervat davar, some unseemly matter. And the school of Shammai, and this was taken up in, in, in certain Christian circles, understood that to mean that he, while well, he did not have proof he was suspicious that his wife was fooling around on him, and therefore he didn't want to be married to her any longer. However, uh, the school of Hillel was much more lenient. And the famous saying of Rabbi Kiva was that if she burnt his dinner, that was grounds for divorce or could be used. Okay. And the simplest explanation for that is marriage has gotten that to that uh, state where a burnt dinner is, is that cataclysmic, then there's a, the marriage has broken down. And Jewish tradition was never very big on having a divorce, although it's certainly part and parcel of our tradition. Um, furthermore, in the ancient world especially, a woman uh, was never completely safe and secure on her own as an independent person. That's just, that was just the reality of the ancient world. And she was either protected by being the daughter, her father took care of her, watched over her, looked out for her needs, or she was a wife. A single woman was at a very marked disadvantage 
and we can see that also because the Torah uh, oftentimes when it talks about our need to support the people in society who need help, we talk about the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. Because those were considered to be the people most at danger in ancient society. So on the one hand, we have this idea that if a man is unhappy with his wife, he can give her a get. That's what's called in, in Hebrew, a bill of divorce. And she's out of luck. So the rabbis early on instituted what I call as a ketubah. Yeah, we talked about the signing of ketubah before the wedding ceremony. And in that ketubah was the protection that a woman had. And that's why the monies involved with it were very important. That's why the rabbi said a man and woman shouldn't live together as husband and wife without a written ketubah. And uh, when you... Uh, go through the Talmud and talking about divorce and things like that, the Ketubah becomes extremely important, extremely important inheritance issues and all kinds of things in the ancient world. Like I say, today, the, the Ketubah and the Get are pro forma, but they're very important for Jewish tradition. And a man and a woman who are married Jewishly, traditionally cannot get married again if there was not a get issued, there was no, there was not a Jewish divorce. Now we do know also, and you know, we read about it in the Torah, and see it in other books of the Bible, that polygamy was practiced in ancient Israel. A man could have more than one wife. That's why adultery was defined by the status of the woman in the ancient world. If a married woman has sexual relations with someone other than her husband. That was the definition of adultery. Uh, because a man could only commit adultery if he ha was uh, having relations to, with somebody else's wife. If he took another woman, he, she could be another wife for him. So in the ancient world, that was not considered to be adultery. Might not be proper behavior if he wasn't marrying her, but nonetheless, it wasn't considered to be adultery in that sense, in technical term. So, the rabbis create the ketubah. They say a man can divorce his wife if he wants to, but then they make it very difficult for him. Uh, for, for example, in, uh, we know in Alexandria in the, around the year 1000, give or take, uh, there was a special uh, codicil written into the ketubot that a man could not take a second wife or even hire a female servant without the permission of his wife. And if he chose to do so, there was a very heavy fine that he had to pay her. And a substantial fine. There were wealthy men who may have more than one wife. But around the same time that this was developing in, in Africa, North Africa, in uh, which uh, the Jews were living amongst uh, Muslims, and Muslims had the practice of having polygamy, the Jews in Europe were living amongst Christians who did not practice polygamy. And so around the year 1000, a little bit before then, there was a famous takana of Rabbeinu Gershom. Rabbeinu Gershom, Rabbi Gershom, uh, was one of the most outstanding figures of that period of history in Europe, in Europe, amongst the Jews. And he was credited with issuing a number of takanot. And these takanot, uh, and many, uh, many of them were for the protection of a woman. First of all, uh, they ruled that a man could not take a second wife. They made a special exception to that if their 100 rabbis agreed to it, and it was for special circumstances, uh, he could do so. Let's say uh, the, the woman uh, became uh, incompetent and he needs somebody to care for his children and his family. All right, uh, that's one. Another thing is the rabbi said a man could not divorce his wife against her will. Uh, 
and uh, they, uh, a number of other items as well. So these protections were there to protect the wife, but what they could not do was to give the wife the power of divorce. The understanding was that this was a biblical law. You cannot override such a biblical law. You could put fences around it. You could protect the man. You can uh, stop the man from divorcing his wife, but you could not change it so that she could divorce him. Uh, don't let me forget, before the end of the evening, I'll talk about uh, special circumstances uh, in today's world. Okay. So let us say the reality is a husband and wife, uh, things happen. We pray to God they don't happen in a marriage, but they do sometimes. Uh, and it is better to go live apart be a part, start life over again. Uh, now, as I said, rabbinic tradition was very hesitant in this area. They wanted shalom bayit, peace at home. Um, and sometimes my Orthodox colleagues, even today, uh, overdo it in that department. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, uh, a friend of my wife and I uh, was visiting with us. We knew her for many, many years. Uh, from an, uh, when we were in, in Texas at a shul in Texas, she and her husband unfortunately got divorced. She was staying with us for several months, and uh, a get was issued for her from her husband. It was an Orthodox get, and duly witnessed by the Orthodox rabbis in the area. But they, he was in El Paso, and she was in Toronto, and so the get had to be delivered to her. Uh, through agency, and so they uh, went before the local Beit Din, Orthodox Beit Din. I appeared as a witness to who she was and et cetera. Uh, and they tried at that point to see if they could say, you know, maybe you don't need to have a get, you don't need to have a divorce, which is a little ridiculous. You know? They've been away from each other for a long time. They're different countries at the time, but they, they had to put their nose in it that way. Okay? But that's how uh, stringent uh, the idea is to try and, and, and avoid uh, a, a divorce. But if it's if indeed this is what it comes to, um, what happens traditionally is only a few uh, scribes are around who write get get write a get. It's a very a complicated uh, procedure. Uh, what usually transpires is in front of a bait din, a man the husband appoints a scribe to write a get for his wife. And it has to be uh, only for his wife. It can't be a fill in the blank get. And they make sure to know all the names that both parties are known by. For example, uh, my get, if God forbid, pui, 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 if I, after almost 50 years, it's too late to give a get to my wife. But anyway. If uh, I were to give her a get, God forbid, it would be I, I, it would be identified as a Rav Menachem Yosef Ben Zev Berman. That's my Hebrew name with a title rabbi. Also known in English as Martin Jeffrey Berman, also known as Marty Berman. Any kind of nickname and thing that I would be known by. Similarly, my wife would have any and all kinds of identification names written into the, the get. And the place and time of the get is identified, what city it's in, what, near, what river it is near. The scribe is empowered to write even up to 100 gitten, 100 gets until this one comes out the way it should be. And so the groom gives uh, he's already gotten it from the scribe to start with. It gives him the special paper and pen and ink and everything for him to go write it. And then you have to wait around until the get is, is written properly. Everything has to be spelled properly. No mistakes are allowed in it. Uh, it's very technical. So then the get is presented in front of the witnesses and this is uh, who's ever conducting this get. 
and they check it out and make sure that this is the get that was written for on behalf of this man and this woman. And the uh, husband has to acknowledge that this is the get that he did empower this scribe to write. Uh, he th it's then folded up and the groom has to drop it into the hands of the wife or her agent who's there to collect it for her, who then takes four steps, turns around, comes back. Again, the get is looked at, examined to make sure that this is the same one that's been there the whole time. And then traditionally what happens is the get is, is cut. It, uh, razor blade cuts in it, so it cannot be used again. And the groom, bride and uh, the bride and groom, the husband and wife are issued what is called a patur, a document saying that this get was duly con uh, uh, given on a such and such a date, and in three months' time they can remarry, you marry somebody else. Okay, the three month time is really make sure that the woman's not pregnant. It goes back to the ancient uh, world that in three months a woman generally showed, even today. Uh, and without being able to check paternity and all that, uh, it was the issue when to make sure. Okay. Uh, and so that get is left with that court and I keep a file of it. And if you ever need to be, I had to deal with a case one time, I had to check up on a get. Uh, it was a crazy case. Uh, but anyway, it was a crazy woman who wanted to, to, who wanted to challenge the get. And she's crazy for wanting to challenge it because here's the issue. Now, I said before that only the husband has power of divorce in Jewish tradition. And that still holds true in the conservative movement in an orthodox world, the reform and, and reconstruction, others may do, what, do different things. However, we do know that the following uh, is found in the Talmud, that if a man issues a get for his wife and he sends it to her by an agent, to deliver to her, and the and the agent, the shliach, walks outside, walks out the door, and the guy has second thoughts. He could, in theory, cancel the get, and the get would be no good. The problem is, it gets to the woman. Let's say she's in Rome, he's in Jerusalem. It takes a few months to get there, it takes a uh, time for it to transpire. She thinks she's divorced. She remarries on the basis of that get. And then comes, lo and behold, the husband gets in touch with her and says, you know, sorry, you're not divorced. I didn't divorce you. And all your children are mom's Zerim. They're bastards. Any children you have from this man. So the rabbi said, if a man does such a thing, gives a get to an agent and the agent leaves and then the husband nullifies the get the rabbis say that the marriage is null and void from the very beginning they use the power what they call hefker bait din hefker that the bait din the court the rabbinic court has the power to declare property ownerless so they say that ring that that man gave to that woman all those years ago when they got married, we declare after the fact that it did not belong to him. Since it did not belong to him, he didn't give her anything. Since he didn't give her anything from him, there was never a marriage. That's called hafka'at kiddushim. The rabbis felt that they had the authority to do that under special circumstances. And we know that authority existed. It was, it was not really used, but it was there. So in the conservative movement, and there have been some Orthodox rabbis who've also suggested the same thing, uh, do permit under certain circumstances to use hafka'at kiddushin to uproot kiddushin. Now it's not a divorce. And that's why there's complications, why the Orthodox are very un, un, uncertain about it. And it means that the man and woman together for all those years, at least according to traditional Jewish understanding of it, they, they were having sexual relations outside the bounds of marriage. Uh, and the children are not mom zayram, if they have children, but they're not, quote, legitimate of, to the husband. 
it doesn't really change anything to the most part, but that's, that's it. So it, it's not a very nice thing to have to go through. But if the husband refuses to give a get and there's no way they can force him to do it, that can transpire. Now, in the state of Israel, land of Israel, the rabbinic courts have power over marriage and divorce. And the rabbinic courts can turn to the secular courts and say, Chaim Yankel refuses to give his wife a get, leaving her an aguna, a chained woman. We insist that she deserves to be given a get. He's recalcitrant. And we ordered him to give a get of his own free will, and he refuses. So therefore, the civil courts can say, all right, you have to listen to the rabbis and give, them a, a get, give a get to your wife. And if you don't, we're going to throw you in jail until you decide to give your wife a get. And that's happened. Not too often, but it's happened. And sometimes a guy such as Mamser, uh, SOB, whatever language you want to use, he'd rather be in prison than give his wife a get. Now, for those of you who are old enough to have seen the very first uh, uh, that's Gina, what's, oh. Uh, 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 it was on the top of my head, the, the mobster uh, series. Uh, oh, don't worry about it. Anyway, it, it, uh, the, the Rambam Maimonides in, in based upon the Tom, it says, that if a man is ordered by the court to give his wife a get, the court can give him lashes until he says, I want to give my wife a divorce of my own free will. All right, because uh, the rabbi said, everybody wants to do what's right. Sometimes your yetzer hara, your evil urge gets in the way. And so if we can beat you down, beat down the Yetzir Hara, the evil urge, then you'll do the right thing and then force by your own free will. And we know that in different communities in different periods of time, that's taken place. That the courts have insisted the man give his wife a get, he doesn't want to, and they some find, uh, find some way to pressure him. There were Jewish communities, and still happens today, where the husband refuses, and the wives in, in that community, the Orthodox community, they were they're, they're, they're all connected with each other. The wives say, we're not going to go to the mikvah until he gets his wife a divorce again. So the husbands, who now have no uh, outlet for their sexual relations with their wives, they give him a little... Uh, uh, don't you think you ought to give your wife a get until they finally convince them somehow to do so? I was thinking about was on the very first Sopranos on HBO. They have a scene in, a, in which the, the, the mafia is, is, is contacted to beat up a guy so that he will give a get to his wife. And that's not really fiction. Yeah, the, the story was fiction, but it has happened. And there are cases even till today where there's some rabbis who have gotten into that sort of thing. It's not a very pleasant thing. It's not, uh, now, there are other things that are also done. Now, for example, in the conservative ketubah that many use, there is what is known as the uh, Lieberman uh, uh, clause. And the Lieberman clause essentially says that uh, if either party refuses to give or get, accept a get, the, the rabbinical court is empowered to issue a get on behalf of the husband. And if he refuses he, uh, to give a get, they can turn to the civil courts and uh, seek damages. The Orthodox also have one like that, but there they have a contractual obligation that uh, every day that the man refuses to give his wife a get, or every day she refuses to accept a get, there's a certain financial penalty that they agree to before the wedding that will transpire. All of these are means and methods trying to uh, protect the Jewish woman who otherwise would uh, have difficulties. Uh, so 
th that's uh, uh, in a nutshell what's in term involved today in, in the Jewish world in terms of getting, of, of issuing get. Oh, it, Rabbi Berman, sorry, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Uh, with regards to the get. So, um, like we have right now uh, the tradition, like the regular registration, right, for the marriage, which is like just. Okay, uh, that's a civil. Now, that's all civil. civil. Just what I was wondering, like, so if you have a civil marriage and you have like uh, a Jewish marriage, right, like with the guild. So let's say that uh, the people like nowadays, like how, okay. like if one person doesn't want to, but you can still get uh, okay. divorced, right? Yeah. All right. Let me, let me go. There, there are two different issues. There is civil law and there's religious law. Under civil law, the state uh, in, in uh, uh, Ontario has got a real good system on that. Yes, you can get a, a divorce without the religious divorce. But there is also a law in the books in Ontario that uh, if either party prevents the other party from getting remarried as a result of religious issues, there's are certain uh, uh, ways that the court can enforce uh, that the person, the recalcitrant individual to, to stop their recalcitrance. So yes, you can, it, 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 there, there are different ways, different things can happen. Ideally, if you know, you get, you're going to get married Jewishly, you have to have a civil license the rabbi, the priest, whoever performs the, the religious ceremony also performs the civil ceremony by, by our system here. If God forbid you break up the marriage, you get a get, you give a get and you have a civil divorce, everybody's happy as it can be under the circumstances. Now, yeah, you can uh, have a civil license have a civil marriage without any religious marriage, have a civil divorce without any kind of religious divorce. And that is usually accepted as uh, at least post facto, no, nothing else. If two Jews did that, two Jews did not get married through a rap, with a rabbi and they had a civil divorce, if, if uh, possible, we try to have the husband give a get nonetheless. If not, then because, uh, generally speaking, we'll recognize that there, no, there was no religious marriage. Now, you can also have a religious marriage, a civil marriage, get divorced civilly and never get a religious divorce. If you want to get married in a traditional synagogue, you can't do that without the get. Some people do that. Some people will turn to the reform. The reform don't necessarily insist upon a get. So those are all the things that are out there, Christina. Yeah, you know, there's Rabbi, the right Rabbi way Berman, and the wrong is way. It, is it true that if an Agana hat doesn't get a get and, and has children, that those children are moms or him? Yes, if indeed you can't find a way around it. Now, the Orthodox so, world- Sorry, what a mother what? Okay. In English, we talk about bastards. We're not, we're, that's not the correct term. In Jewish law, it states that if a woman has a child by any, you know, if she's married and the father of the child is anyone but her duly married husband, the child has the status of a mamzer. And a mamzer can only marry another mamzer. They cannot marry a Jew who's not a mamzer. It's a very terrible price to pay. Now, also, again, this is an area where we're told in the Talmud and the ideal is you don't ask questions about this. You don't try, you know, you, you try to avoid finding out that somebody is a mom's there. However, in the Orthodox world today, they're acting like moms. There's in, in the sense that they do investigate sometimes and create all kinds of hurdles for people that they shouldn't. There are cases where, well, now, for example, remember I said that we have this idea of the hafka'at kiddushin, the annulment of the marriage. That has been suggested that if a uh, woman had been married Jewishly 
and then did have a get, got pregnant, had a child, that the first husband, original husband, could have a get issued to her, annul the get after it leaves the door, and then marriage will be automatically annulled from the beginning, the original marriage, so the children are not mom's aaron. I know it's a little complicated, but that has been done on a couple of cases. Or there are all kinds of things that are done to try and see any way around it to make sure that they're not, but that's that's reality. Okay. Sir, and how does this guilt look like? Is it like a piece of paper or? It's not it? guilt, it's get. You usually spell G-E-T. It's usually heavy paper. Uh, it's, uh, you don't, the, the people who are involved with it see it for the time that it's taking place. But the get itself, the document itself stays with the court or with the scribe who writes it. Uh, and, and instead a piece of, another piece of paper is called a patur, permission to get married again is issued. And that's what the, the man or the woman has in their hand, possession. Okay, it's a very technical document. It has to have written certain number of lines and words, have, letters have to be, uh, lines have to start with certain letters and things. It's, it's uh, very complicated and intentionally to make it slow to take place so it doesn't just happen right, you know, willy nilly as they say. Okay, any other questions? You should all know from marriages, you should never know from divorces. All right. Okay, we will not meet next week. I am going, uh, originally we thought it might, but I have got a schedule to get my vaccine at around 5.40, yes. Congrats. Yeah, I was too young and too old until till this week. So now you know how old I am. Um, so, but that's at 540 somewhere up in, I, I don't know, north here, uh, somewhere north in Vaughn. And uh, I don't know if timing and everything, if I it work out to have the class. So, you know, I said, uh, I sent out the, uh, the sheet, the, the updated uh, information for the class. Uh, and so in two weeks, we will talk about uh, the end of life and issues that dealing with the end of life and, and burial and things like that. Okay. And so Rabbi, Passover Seder. Rabbi, quick yes. question for you actually about Pesach. Yeah. Um, so the reason uh, we can't have um, like bread and stuff is because it takes time to leaven the bread. And well, that's, we it's, it's the definition is 18 minutes of water being in contact with it. Correct. Correct. So, um, my question is, if you can't have bread because it takes so long for it to rise, why then is there glasses of wine drank when it takes time to ferment alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first is a good question. It, it has nothing to do with time per se. It has to do with fermentation. The correct question is, how can we ferment wine then? would be the question to ask. I don't have a, a, a complete answer to that, except to say it's possible that, that wine was regarded differently. And the fermentation is only the fermentation that takes place on the five grains, wheat, barley, oats, spelt, and rye. But it is certainly a legitimate question uh, and maybe, maybe they, uh, the fact of the matter is it's possible that the ancient world, the rabbis didn't know that it was actually yeast that was on the, the wine, on the grapes that caused the fermentation to take place. Uh, be that as it may, it's, it, it is uh, only an issue in regards to grain, not it, to issue the fruit. So if, for example, if you wanted to make a hard apple cider, you can have hard apple cider. You can have vodka. You cannot have grain-based alcohol. But obviously, the other alcohols are really a result of the same kind of chemical uh, reaction going on, fermentation. I don't think I don't. I'm not really answering. I'm just explaining. 
So then I suppose the next logical question would be, why, if it's just five grains, so like where does ketonio and legumes fall in there? All right. Well, that, first of all, Sephardim don't hold by it. Ashkenazim uh, ruled it out. There are many different attempts to explain it. Some explain it is that it's, uh, these things were too much like uh, the grains and people might get confused using one flour versus the other flour. Uh, some suggest that they were stored together in, in the farmers. When they brought it in, they might get them mixed up together and you would find it. For example, you can, if you buy rice, the uh, Sephardim who eat rice on Pesach, they go through making sure there's no uh, wheat kernels that got mixed in by accident. Uh, if you go to a, a store where they have, you know, uh, bins with wheat in it and bins with corn in it and bins with rice in them, people don't always uh, carefully uh, use the right scoop and stuff can get mixed in together. So the concern was either people would get confused because they would think you could make use regular bread, a regular uh, flour, uh, because you were using the leg legume kidney oat flour, uh, or it was because there's a fear they might get mixed in together in some way, and, and that's the basis for it. Like I said, uh, when we talked about a few weeks ago, there are those in the conservative movement who uh, permit use of legumes to the kidney oat. And there are those who do not. Uh, and so you talk to your rabbi as to guidance for that, okay? Any other questions? Yeah, I had a yes. question with regard to the divorce, right? So you were saying that some conservative, right, and orthodox, uh, like women cannot, uh, um, uh, how do you say that, associate, associate the divorce? Uh, they, can't can start... they, can't, yes. they can't initiate it. it initiate. Really. Yeah. Yes. The, uh, husband has to, the husband has to be the one who, quote, gives the get. Mm -hmm. If he's uncooperative, it creates problems. That's why we have some of these solutions over the course of the ages. Uh, unfortunately, today we can't beat a guy to make him do it. But in mm -hmm. some circumstances, he can be thrown into jail or he can be fined and, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Under, I do mm -hmm. know that the conservative movement, if there is absolute uh, uh, non-cooperation, by the husband, that they will issue a hafgat kiddushin, an annulment of the marriage. So women basically still can say that, like, I want to divorce you. You can say I want, you know, in conservative traditional circles, you can say I want a divorce, mm -hmm. but the bait din has to have permission from the husband for the, the divorce to be mm -hmm. written. Okay. Question then on that, why does then the orthodox based in issues like serum after serum after serum and, and nothing happens or say serum after serum I, i'm sorry i did not quite understand the question I, issue what like a say roof oh because it, it depends on the community and what kind of backing they have to to uh behind this say roof you know if i if we you, you know let's take toronto what kind of enforcement can the local Beit Din have to their their order? That's what a say means. It means a court order to appear before the Beit Din and respond to them properly. Now in Israel- but then is it acceptable to leave the woman as an Agana? Well, what, well, that's why there are different ways that why the conservative movement, if there's no other choice, will do the Hafgad Kiddushin that's why some Orthodox rabbis have suggested a similar practice, but the bulk of the Orthodox world won't accept it. And like I say, they, they fought, try to find other ways to alleviate the situation if they can. There was a very famous case, for example, uh, in Israel, not, it, not, it's not the same thing, but there was a case of Mam Zerut. And Rabbi Goran, who was, a, uh, at that time, he wasn't yet the chief rabbi, but he eventually became the chief rabbi of Israel. 
he eventually what he did, he found a way to, to invalidate the woman's first marriage, claiming the husband was not uh, converted properly to Judaism. Therefore, there was never a marriage. Therefore, the children were not mamzerim. Uh, but in Israel, they can have the man thrown into jail. They don't do it often enough. That is true. Uh, in, in the way things exist in today's world, if, you're, if your synagogue is putting pressure on you, you can't have aliyot to the Torah. Nobody will deal with you. So you go to a different synagogue. We don't have the communal enforcement power that used to exist, for better and for worse. And since it's a law of the Torah, it's very hard to find, you know, you can't just ignore it. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. You have to find, you know, and in the Orthodox world, especially if uh, once you, if you touch anything that has a, a law of the Torah aspect to it, they're very, very hesitant to do anything that might be questionable. So I was saying in the Orthodox world today, the, the modern Orthodox do uh, have bride and groom sign a prenuptial agreement. And, but the more orth, the right wing works, the Haredim won't accept it. They don't approve of it because you're getting the secular courts involved. Yeah, those, uh, those are good actually uh, organizations. I see, I've seen them in the States. Yeah. But you know that you can do it. You know you can do it. Some of the rab my colleagues here do it. I know uh, that a lot of the Orthodox rab modern Orthodox rabbis use that documentation, and that should prove uh, amenable to to uh, resolve the problem when time comes, if it comes to that. But it also becomes an issue of church and state. You know how much leeway do you have in the particular communities in which you live and religious laws and, and religious practices and, and modern democratic ideals and all of those things they get all jumbled together and become creates its issues. Okay. All right, I know Hein, you're going to look at the uh, well, later on. Uh, uh, so anyway, I'm going to uh, post this uh, video as soon as I can. It may not be ready tonight, but uh, it should be ready by tomorrow. Okay. I'll say good night to everybody. Uh, have a good week. Have a good Yantav. And I'll see you after Pesach.